So it was brought to my attention today that on my stat wiki there are guidelines that show you how to develop your model and test your model, but there were no guidelines until now for all that stuff that happens between developing and testing your model. And there's actually quite a bit of stuff that goes into that, so I figured I'd make a section on it, and I'm just going to talk you through it real quick. So we're going to go to the StatWiki General Guidelines section, and it's Section 3, From Model Development to Model Testing. And these are the critical tasks that happen between model development and model testing. Uh, the first step, obviously, develop a decent quantitative model. So that's the previous section. The next step is to find existing scales and develop your own if necessary. So you have your model and you have all these constructs and now you need a way to measure those constructs. So the traditional way to do this, the conventional way, is to go use someone else's scales or measures. Um, so example, for example, their survey. You go find the items from their survey that match the construct that you're interested in. And then you use the items from their survey that they've already used, and uh, presumably that they've already validated. So that's the preferred method. And I've also made a video on how to do this. Here's that video right here, how to find existing scales. Now, once you find those scales, you'll probably need to adapt them to your own context. For example, if the scales were used in the context of website usage and you were doing a study on virtual reality, well, that's a slightly different context. And so you might need to change the wording of a scale that used to refer to, for example, a website and change it to something that talks about using virtual reality. You have quite a bit of liberty in adapting scales as long as you maintain the spirit or intent of those items, then you're good. Now along this idea of adapting, a lot of existing scales are ginormous, like have 10 or more items. That's a lot of items, and if you're using something that's truly a, ref a reflective construct, you don't need more than four or five items. In fact, more than four or five items is fairly redundant since the items are considered or required to be roughly interchangeable. So, my recommendation, in order to not bloat your survey, is to simply pick the four to five items that best capture the construct you're interested in. Even if they have 12 items in their survey um, for that particular construct, just trim it down to four or five items that best suit your construct. And again, if this is a reflective construct, or a set of reflective measures, then it shouldn't matter whether you have three of them or 20 of them because they're all capturing the same idea. Now if the scale is not reflective or if it's multi-dimensional or formative, you have one of three options. You can keep the entire scale so that you capture all of the dimensions. By dimensions I mean it has sort of sub-constructs within the construct. So uh, I, th I think I did a video once on burnout. Burnout is comprised of emotional um, exhaustion, depersonalization, uh, and something else. So three separate dimensions. Well, each of those dimensions is reflective underneath, but together they form this idea of burnout. So these are separate dimensions of burnout. So you have the option to keep the entire scale, and this allows you to use a latent structure later on, although most likely you'll be using a formative latent structure, which requires the use of partial least squares rather than uh, traditional covariance-based approaches like we would use in Amos. Uh, the other option, another option, is to keep only one dimension. So let's say, let's take burnout again. Um, let's say I was mainly interested in emotional exhaustion, that dimension of burnout. Well, then I would just use that dimension and drop the other two. And then I now have a single reflective construct for burnout. The last approach, and this is one you could use for a formative construct with multiple dimensions, is you would keep one item from each of the dimensions. What this allows you to do is not create a reflective latent construct, but it allows you to later on form an aggregate score, so something like a sum or an average or a weighted average of the responses, and this new score 
represents the level or the degree of the construct. Again, if this is burnout, if we kept one item from each of the three dimensions, those three items should move generally in the same direction. And the extent to which they, um, the extent to which the respondent responds high on the scale rather than low on the scale would indicate more burnout instead of less burnout. So the score we're creating is a good indication of the construct we're trying to capture. All right, so that's for existing scales. If you're going to develop your own scales, uh, this can be a bit trickier, but people make it out to be crazy hard, and it's really not crazy hard. It just involves a little bit more work. Um, so what you need to do is first define your construct. This is critical. You must define your construct precisely before you can develop measures for it. If you don't know what your construct is, i.e. you have not defined it, uh, you can't create measures for it because you don't know what you're measuring. I then strongly recommend developing reflective scales, if applicable. You, you don't have to have reflective scales, but these do work out more uh, seamlessly with all of the videos I've created on Amos and SPSS. And uh, the whole SEM series, these all use reflective scales. Again, if you're going to use formative scales, you might want to just take this approach I, I talk about above with multidimensional constructs. Okay. I recommend creating five interchangeable statements that can be measured on a five point or seven point Likert scale of agreement or frequency or intensity, uh, something like that. So, for example, you'd ask a participant to respond to, um, regarding the extent to which they agree, you know, from strongly disagree to strongly agree, uh, regarding these five items. If we were to do one for enjoyment uh, while using a virtual reality system, might have something like this. I enjoyed using the VR. Interacting with the VR was fun. I was happy while using the VR. Notice these are all interchangeable. Um, except number four, which is reverse coded. Using the VR was boring. Number five, uh, using the VR was pleasurable. So I have five items that capture this idea of enjoyment while using the VR. And uh, one which is reverse coded, which I will have to re-reverse once I collect data. The next thing you'll need to do if you're developing your own scales is a pretest, which includes talk alouds and cue sorts. And you could also include other activities, but these are the two main activities. So a talk aloud is where you just sit down with people from your target population. So for example, if you're going to be studying uh, CEOs, you go talk to a CEO. Uh, if you can't access CEOs or you're going to cannibalize your population, maybe go talk to upper level management someone who can represent or at least give the perspective you might get from that population. But you go sit down with them and have them read your items out loud. And if they stumble, then you probably need to reword it. If they don't know how to respond, you probably need to clarify it. If they say, well, it depends in response, uh, then obviously your item is talking about something that needs to be more granular. Um, you need to get more specific or more contextualized or uh, remove caveats or whatever so that they can answer with confidence the extent to which they agree or disagree or, or whatever the Likert scale might be, if you're using Likert scales. You would do this with one person at a time. Go talk to them, get the feedback, revise your instrument as needed, and then go talk to another person. And you're going to repeat this exercise until you have diminishing returns until you aren't learning anything new from sitting down with these participants. The next thing you can do, which is a bit of a pain, uh, both for the participants and for you, is a cue sort. This is just an exercise where the participant sorts your questions, your cues, into piles based on which construct they think that item is measuring. So one way to do this is just to write all of your item wordings on three by five cards, and then write your construct labels and definitions on big pieces of paper, and then give the cards to a participant, have them read the item wording, and then place it on the big piece of paper uh, relative to, to the construct that they think it's measuring. If they get it quote unquote wrong if they place an item where it shouldn't be if they place it on a different construct well then you know you have a conceptual 
problem. Uh, you, you, have, you don't have conceptual distinction between uh, the items from that construct and the item they misplaced there. And so you need to try to increase the conceptual distance between that item and the construct it was misplaced on. Now the Q sort should be given to at least eight participants, all at the same time, or at least you're not going to do work between the Q sorts. You're going to give it to all of them and then see what the consensus is. If the consensus is greater than 70% agreement between participants, then you know you've done a good job. If it's not, then you know you need to increase conceptual distinction between the items that were uh, misplaced and the constructs upon which they were misplaced. Repeat this exercise with more participants, different participants, until you arrive at adequate consensus. You've now finished pretesting all of your measures. The next thing to do is to identify a target sample and, if necessary, get approval to contact them. Um, you don't have to do this for all populations. For example, if you're studying your own students, if you're a professor, um, then you don't have to get approval from yourself. But if you're studying someone else's students, you would obviously need to talk to that professor. Or if you're studying employees at a certain organization, you need to get approval from their managers or whoever has stewardship over those people. Once you have approval, you can then um, either go conduct a pilot study or jump straight to IRB approval. Why would I say uh, that this is optional? I, I don't list it anywhere as optional, but it it is not always feasible to do a pilot study. A pilot study is where you actually go out and collect data from your population, somewhere between 30 and 100 participants. And then you use that smaller data set to obtain reliability scores like a Cronbex Alpha for your reflective latent factors and to confirm the relationships um, in your model, at least the direction of those relationships. You might not have enough statistical power to get good p-values, but uh, at least you can see the direction of the relationships is as hypothesized. Um, you can also do manipulation checks if you're using experimental designs. Doing the Cronbex Alphas and doing like small EFAs, this will at least show you that your survey is doing its job, uh, collecting the constructs as intended. Now you probably won't have enough statistical power to do a full EFA or CFA um, or a full causal model, but you can do it with smaller subsets of the items or smaller um, causal relationships. Just do a simple linear regression between your IV and your DV. See if it's in the direction you thought it should be. This is what the pilot study is for. If the results aren't good. It turns out um, you have a lot of cross loadings, for example, in your EFA, or your Cronbex alphas are in the 0.4 and 0.5 range. Uh, then you know you need to go back and revise your survey, re revise those items to be stronger, uh, more conceptually tight within a construct, more conceptually distinct uh, between constructs. Now, oftentimes it's not feasible to do a pilot study. Uh, for example, if you're targeting a difficult to access population like surgeons or CEOs or people who run family owned businesses. These are really hard people to access. And so if you're going to do a pilot study, that's going to cannibalize your sample size, your eventual sample size. And so doing a pilot study in this case would actually be detrimental to your final study, especially if you do this pilot study before you get IRB approval, because any data you collect prior to obtaining IRB approval cannot be used in a published manuscript. Um, however, however, if you get IRB approval before doing a pilot study, then you can actually use the data from your pilot study in your final sample um, if the survey didn't change. Now, um, time might also be a constraint. You might not have time to do a pilot study. Let's say you're under some sort of deadline, you're a student, um, you're uh, doing a revise and resubmit, and you're under a time crunch, and there just isn't time to do a pilot study. Um, it is reasonable not to do a pilot study, just be aware that you might end up saving time by doing a pilot study, because you might catch things that would have um, made your final collection of data invalid. And so if you skip the pilot study, that big data collection, collection you do at the end might be invalid, because of things you could have caught during the pilot study. All right, next, get IRB approval. You should know this, obviously, you can't collect data from humans. 
Um, I think there's even restrictions on animals. Anyway, you shouldn't collect data from humans um, unless you've obtained approval from the IRB board at your local institution or at the institution where you'll be collecting data. Um, I don't think I wrote this in here, but if you're collecting data at multiple institutions, um, you'll need to check with the IRB at all of the institutions to see if they require IRB approval from their own institution or only from the originating institution where the, um, where the primary author is located. Do not delay in doing IRB approval. Um, it can take anywhere from three days, which is ridiculously fast, the fastest I've ever had it go through, um, to six weeks and even more, depending on how normal your study is. Um, if you're doing just a typical organizational study where you go uh, see the performance of the organization or of the employees and look at the dispositions or intentions of employees, things like that, very standard, they just zip right through the IRB process. But if you're doing anything that inv involves any form of deception or risk, no matter what type of risk to the participants, this requires a lot of extra consideration by the IRB. They're very hesitant to let it go through, and you might be required to make an oral defense of your study and why it is appropriate and how you're going to protect the participants. So this takes quite a bit longer and will delay your study, pro um, your study timeline quite a bit. All right, the last thing is collect your data. Ah, you made it. Um, collecting your data can take anywhere between three days and three months, depending on who you're collecting data from um, and various other factors. Be prepared to send a lot of reminders and incentives. It is not uncommon for your initial invitation to uh, take a survey to go ignored. Um, I have an example here that may seem ridiculous, but it is fairly right on. I'm just going to read it to you because it is to the point. For example, if you are targeting an email list of 10,000 brand managers, expect half of the emails to be returned um, as abandoned email addresses, and three quarters of the remainder to go unread, and then 90% of the remainder of that to be ignored. That leaves you with only 125 responses, 20% of which may be unusable because they didn't respond to the whole survey, uh, thus leaving you with only 100 usable responses from your original 10,000. This is not uncommon, depending on who you're targeting. Again, if you're targeting students and you're giving them extra credit and you're giving them an iPad for a reward or whatever, then you typically have greater than that. You have a 90% response rate. If you're targeting CEOs or upper level management or anyone who's busier than students, um, the response rates drop precipitously. Finally, you can test your model, which I go over in the next section. I hope that was helpful. I hope this uh, clears up a lot of the murk and confusion and ambiguity that happens between developing your model and testing your model, because that's just no fun to be in the dark.